Hello and welcome once again to Father Spitzer's Universe, where no man has gone before. I'm Doug Keck, your host, coming to you live from our EWTN studios in Irondale, Alabama, where it all began, the mothership, where Mother Angelica started it back in 1981. And now we're a global, worldwide, 250 million plus homes. Send us an email, check us out on Facebook. These are all the ways to participate in the show. Send us a tweet on Twitter. And for all things Father Spitzer's, there's only one place to go. That is the Magis Center's website, magiscenterwinword.com. Today's topic, believe it or not, we are actually getting to the conclusion of the light shines on in the darkness. That's right. Uh, there's been so much meat to go through. We're finally getting to the conclusion, so we'll see how Father does in wrapping things up for us. And speaking of books, we've got a great new book out by our good friend, Father Charles Connor, published by EWTN, entitled Pioneer Priests and Makeshift Altars, A History of Catholicism in the 13 Colonies. If you know Father Connor's work on EWTN, he's great at explaining history, and he comes across as if he actually lived it. And speaking of that, we're also on the road to Bethlehem. I mentioned it once before, Journeys Through Time and Space. Now, this is a great family game, and it's so good, EWTN's not even selling it. So we're telling you to just go to this website. It's on there, www.roadtobethlehem. It's the number two, Bethlehem.com. It's a, a wonderful way to spend time with your family, enjoying each other, and learning something about the faith. And speaking about learning something about the faith, Father Spitzer is always teaching. His DVD collections are all available through EWTN's religious catalog. Here's one. Look at that young face. It's Virtue, Freedom, and Faith. There's Father Spitzer in some of those youthful days of his when he was doing series here at EWTN. And speaking of him, we turn now to the West Coast in Orange County, California, where we see the one and only Father Spitzer as he appears today. Oh, you look exactly <laughs> the same, actually. You even look younger. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> now, remember, confession for that's lies. That's right. That's right. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, you weren't willing to hear it over the phone, so I, I had to go to uh, Father Joseph once again, who's a tough taskmaster, I have to tell you. <laughs> but anyway, and of course, we're talking about that's your right. book and the conclusion of that, and before we get into that, uh, why don't you uh, start us off with a prayer coming out of the Thanksgiving week as we head into to Advent. Absolutely. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you to send your Holy Spirit down upon us so that uh, all in our audience may deepen their awareness of your love for them, particularly in times of suffering, the path you've prepared for them from suffering into the purification of love and faith, and even into your very kingdom, your very salvation. We ask that that wisdom that we obtain may be shared with others so that we might form a community of love through the suffering and the faith in our lives. We ask all of these things through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And Mary, seat of wisdom, pray, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, here, let's uh, kick off the show with a question. Uh, Dear Father Spitzer, my whole family loves Father Spitzer's universe. However, it seems that he is only on at one time one week, another time during the next week, and at times twice in a week. Our kids oh. like a time when they can listen to him before late night. Can't his program be scheduled in a permanent place? Thank you. And this is Loreline. And I can let me take this one because I okay. clarify that the show is on normally every week at the same time. It's gonna put them up on your screen right now. Father Spitzer's Universe on television. This is for the US and Canada Wednesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern, You're watching us live. Wednesdays, 10 p.m. tonight, so you can watch the replay tonight. Saturday at midnight Eastern time. That's all the times it airs on television, also on radio. This Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern, you can listen to us on radio, and then Sunday it's repeated as well, so uh, at 12 p.m. Eastern. And don't forget, we are on demand as well. You can go to our on-demand website through EWTN, www.ew10.com forward slash on demand for a site that's got over 12,000 videos included in those on a regular basis is Father Spitzer's Universe. So there's a myriad of ways you can watch us obviously online every which way we can. We're trying to get out the truth and certainly trying to get out the wonderful teachings as displayed by Father Spitzer on this program. So uh, hopefully you'll find Father Spitzer where you want to find him on your EWTN television. Okay, up next, here's a real question for you, Father. 
Dear Father okay. Spitzer, I prayed for an answer to my grief and later had a dream which I took to be from God. A few nights later, I prayed again and had a terrible dream on the same subject, which seemed to indicate to me that God doesn't exist, or if he does, that he's cruel. Can Satan enter or influence your dreams? And this is a thanks from Mary. Uh, hi, Mary. Uh, yes, um, you've got the right answer to your question, except for the first part. God very much does exist, and so you don't want to conclude, you know, that uh, a, a bad dream uh, necessarily came from God. And I think you, you've, in the second part of your uh, answer there, you're absolutely correct. Yes, Satan can absolutely enter into your dreams and not only that but you have what's called a subconscious mind yourself and that subconscious mind can also uh, enter into you know your dream world and it can very much have sometimes bad associations with it the subconscious mind mm -hmm. is an associative mind and so if you uh, randomly associate uh, a certain event with something that's bad in your life or or something of that nature your own mind could bring in that very mm -hmm. bad data uh, or could bring in a bad image or have a uh, you know a very cruel outcome and of course yes Satan absolutely can influence uh, your dream world no question about that and of course the Saints have mm -hmm. spoken about that in in many different contexts so you you really do have to be careful about dreams and interpreting dreams and, and sometimes you might think well if I had a good dream it was from God Saint Ignatius of Loyola would say you know that is entirely possible a very good dream and a consoling dream does frequently come from the Holy Spirit comes from God it can also again come from your subconscious mind uh, and, and so no problem there but absolutely you could have a bad dream that does not come from God at all and most of the time bad dreams don't come from God they come from either our own mm -hmm. subconscious mind or from the evil mm -hmm. one who of course wants any form of progress you might make, any form of confidence you would be developing mm -hmm. in God to be shattered. And uh, so don't let him pull it off and don't let yourself pull it off from mm -hmm. your own subconscious mind. Uh, just be very, very wise and astute about how you interpret these dreams, particularly mm -hmm. the bad ones. But I think you really know the answer uh, pretty much already. Great question, Mary. Right, okay. So let me ask you, in, in dealing with things like that, do most of the time people's dreams uh, dealing with their fears or their hopes, or does it depend on the person, or is there any scientific sense of that? Actually, uh, dreams are highly associative, mm -hmm. and it depends on whether a particular image that uh, you might have seen during the day, for mm -hmm. example. Well, you're going to take that image into your dream world at night. Mm -hmm. It's almost inevitable. Or you might have heard something during the day from somebody. Now, if you associate that with a past uh, event maybe or a past memory that has a fear intrinsic to it you probably will have a fearful dream mm -hmm. uh, and if you associate it with a, a memory of something that was very good very consoling mm -hmm. you, you are likely to have a, a very good dream if you go to bed very troubled at night uh, frequently uh, you are going to have right the, the feelings themselves will bring on bad associations and bad memories mm -hmm. uh, from your subconscious mind without any suggestion from the devil now um, you, you could conjure up then a perfectly horrible dream you know on your on just on your mm -hmm. own uh, because of your past associations with something or because of the feelings that you had when you went to sleep um, you know, and then, of course, can the devil play on that mm -hmm. additionally? Oh, yeah. I mean, he can absolutely, you know, wreak havoc on, uh, on anybody, uh, you know, especially if you've started off in a troubled state. Uh, he's more than glad uh, to, to help you with some desolation uh, to separate you uh, from God and put you in darkness. Right. So, um, it, you know, yeah, it, it right. could be either way, Doug. Well, I think also, let me just ask you this question. I think it might even be a mm -hmm. question we had for one of the past shows or a future show. But I guess mm -hmm. a lot of us try to think about, does, uh, let's say, the tempter, the demon, whatever, does... Uh -huh. 
can they read your thoughts? I mean, can they go into your dreams like that? I mean, oh, what are yeah. their limitations? I mean, oh, no, a, a, a tempter can uh, definitely know what you're thinking. There's okay. no doubt about that. And uh, that's what enables the evil spirit to determine whether or not you're free or whether you're uh, as it were, biting for his suggestion, mm -hmm. and to sort of enhance the uh, um, the uh, the uh, uh, temptation. Mm -hmm. uh, alternatively, of course, the Holy Spirit can also know uh, what you're thinking, can know when you're free, and and so forth, and and so he can also uh, you know reinforce his. Uh, you know, uh, a viewpoint mm -hmm. and, and block even the, mm -hmm. the devil's viewpoint. I mean, many are the times when I think I'm being uh, subjected to temptation mm -hmm. uh, just, you know, in my imagination. Uh, also, you know, whatever applies to the imagination can apply to the dream world, right? So, uh, but I'm being subjected to temptation in my imagination or in my dreams, and I can see, you know, I, uh, like in my imagination, I'm, I'm actively uh, in my free will right at that juncture i can definitely um you know pray to saint michael the archangel for mm -hmm. protection i can pray to mary or to the lord for protection and of course uh i am protected i i, I get almost an immediate response not just a you know a calming of the temptation but the kind of the parts of the temptation that i just feel like I'm being just overwhelmed by them. Mm -hmm. uh, that prayer to St. Michael, it works for me, and right. so does the prayer to, to, to uh, you know, the Lord. But also, uh, in, in dream world, of course, you're, you're not free, and, mm -hmm. and you're kind of, you know, you're, even though your consciousness or your subconscious is interacting with the dream world, your conscious, mm -hmm. uh, you know, awareness is interacting with the dream world, it's not doing it on a completely voluntary basis. You're kind of subject to the laws of your dreams and to the conditions conditions of your dreams mm -hmm. and so you know the normally the reason that the evil one or the Holy Spirit is involved in in dreams is the evil one is involved in dreams because mm -hmm. he wants you to wake up in a troubled state like uh, Mary did mm -hmm. uh, but um, also uh, the Holy Spirit gets involved in dreams because he wants you to wake up in, in a hopeful state right. uh, in a state of consolation okay very good next up another email dear father I have stage four lung cancer, oh my. I consider it a grace that I am able to partake in our Lord's sufferings. Before I got sick, I was on the direct path of self-destruction. Now I live yeah. for our Lord. My remaining time on earth will now be meaningful. Blessed Andre said, and I quote, if we knew the value of suffering, we would ask for it, end quote. Interesting. Yeah, no, I, I, would, uh, I, I couldn't agree more mm -hmm. uh, with your assessment. And, you know, um, I know when I get to heaven, all the kinds of suffering that, you know, I, I looked upon, I said, well, not much good came from that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to look back on it and go, Phew, thank God I had that suffering. That's the only reason I wound up here, mm -hmm. you know, in heaven, that is to say. And I, I just know this mm -hmm. is, I'm going to get such a perspective on suffering when I look back from heaven on, on the whole prospect. But right now, you know, when we kind of live it, we want to escape it and so forth. So it's a very, you know, trying uh, thing indeed. So the, the, the main thing, though, um, you know, is you have the right attitude. I know mm. so many people who've been prevented uh, from a life of self-destruction by suffering. Mm. I mean, uh, you know, in Alcoholics Anonymous, they have this whole thing about reaching, you know, the lowest low, the bottom of the mm. bottom, you know, the ground floor. And when you reach it, that's the time you're finally free Mm -hmm. to see what a destructive path you were on and to freely renounce it. You know, there's this old expression in economics, never waste a perfectly good recession, mm -hmm. right? Because in recessions, you get all kinds of purifications of the economy. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the same thing. Never waste perfectly good suffering. Even if you can't see the rationale, the good that's coming out from it right now, you can very much, in retrospect, like the questioner just said, in retrospect, you can see, oh, my gosh, you know, that's suffering, this bad news, this kind of, you know, whacked over the head with stage four lung cancer. Mm -hmm. Now I finally get the path I was on. 
I can renounce it freely mm -hmm. because I can see it for what it is and I can allow the Lord in that freedom to lead me towards salvation through the purification of my love and faith. And that happens to so many people so often. Certainly in my case, I don't think I was on the path to self-destruction, mm -hmm. but I can see all kinds of things that I was doing, you know, in retrospect before I got my right. uh, eye disease right. where I was just being as proud as you could possibly be, including spiritual pride, <laughs> you know, and I was certainly being as impatient as I could cer certainly be. I'm still impatient to this day, don't get me wrong. <laughs> You could ask my assistant and so forth. But all these various things, I, I could see them in a much higher degree. Mm -hmm. And I did get a, a huge amount of freedom mm -hmm. just by the troubles of my life. And the fact that when I finally did what the questioner did, namely when I finally just said, mm -hmm. you know, the real point of my life is to get to heaven. You know, and, uh, you know, this stuff is a big, huge interference. And I got... You know, I got my priorities right. Seek first the kingdom of God and all else will be given you besides. And then on top of it, I got the freedom to pursue the kingdom of heaven through that suffering. I can see in retrospect, yeah, I, I, I was not on a, maybe a path to self-destruction, but I was certainly on right. a path that was not perfectly uh, healthy. And it certainly wasn't the path of the mm -hmm. saints. I'm still not on the path of the saints. I've still got my problems, but to, uh, to a lesser degree, right. thanks to my suffering. Well, let me ask, you, that, let me ask you that question because that comes up with, yeah. you know, a lot of people always wondering why do we have to, you know, we have the image of our Lord on the cross, obviously. And so there's, there's yeah. that relationship, but also the idea of, Besides the actual, you know, physical suffering, is there also, and I was going to ask you in your particular case, mm -hmm. the idea of someone who's so, quote unquote, autonomous in so many ways yeah. now has to rely on other people's help and then hence oh, yeah. has to deal with some level of pride in having mm -hmm. to ask when they're not used to asking. Oh, yeah. No, I got to have to tell you this in my life, uh, you know, half of my problem with pride mm. was just the autonomy problem mm -hmm. alone, you know, and you don't even realize it. But when you grow up in the culture, you get a lot of that idea of, you know, I carry my own weight. Mm -hmm. You ought to carry yours, mm -hmm. you know, and there's just no putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. And I found that when when everything was going perfectly great, you know, mm -hmm. you can just get right in the old car and <laughs> zoom off and, you know, uh, uh, you know, you don't need, you know, the help, you know, with anything, you know, we kind of get it. School comes easy. Graduate school is great. Mm -hmm. You know, the books are zipping out, you mm -hmm. know, and things are going great guns. You don't even realize it, but you begin to get that stoic philosophy, you know, mm -hmm. I carry my own weight, you carry yours. Mm -hmm. And then once you start, you know, thinking this, you know, it, it is really amazing how your ability to walk in somebody else's shoes, your ability to have compassion through empathy mm -hmm. is becoming severely limited because everything just going so right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it compounds on itself. And there's nothing like a good eye disease mm -hmm. to really help you. Where finally, of course, I'm not going to make it through this airport on my own. Mm -hmm. Would somebody give me an elbow, you know? And, of course, you know, you're almost doing it out of desperation. But at first, I tell you, I felt so humiliated, mm -hmm. you know, that I needed the help. I needed to ask. But people are so nice. Mm -hmm. They're so compassionate. The problem wasn't with them. I wasn't troubling them. They were happy to help me. The problem was with me. Mm -hmm. Why do I need help? And why are they the helpers and me the helped? Right. You know, I didn't like that. And so, of course, that was my own mm -hmm. pride. That was my own problem. Mm -hmm. And, of course, it really interferes, that autonomy thing, mm -hmm. really interferes with empathy and compassion. It is not a good philosophy to have. Jesus wasn't trying to breed Stoics. He was really trying to breed compassionate right. people in the image of himself. Right, right. Okay, very good. Let's move on to another question and a kind of a different topic. Father, this is an email. Mm -hmm. Let's assume that I had the great misfortune 
uh, being born in North Korea and experienced an entire mm -hmm. life of suffering. Uh, this life of misery is coupled with the fact that I have no religion, therefore my suffering was not offered up to God. How would I be judged? And this is Alfred. Yeah, Alfred, uh, great question. And, you know, as we, in the Catholic Church, there's that very, very important saying about judgment that pertains to mortal sins. So if you just go back there for just one minute, a mortal sin requires some grievous matter. So you'd have to be doing something that was really grievous. And then you need sufficient reflection. And then you need full consent of the will. That means no impediments to the free use of the will. So the person who grows up, for example, in North Korea, who's never even heard of Jesus, and of course, who, even if he, you know, holds the leader of Korea in complete repudiation, you know, he's forced to like the guy. Mm -hmm. I mean, is it possible that this guy could have sufficient reflection you know, so as to, you know, know uh, either the value of his suffering or whether he's committed a sin or, or something of that nature. Answer, absolutely not. I mean, there's just absolutely n nothing there. And could he, uh, does he have impediments to the free use of his will? I can think of about 20 different impediments mm -hmm. to the free use of his will. He does not have full consent of the will. Mm -hmm. He's got a zillion impediments. He couldn't possibly, right? So remember what the the Second Vatican Council says, right, that we're judged by God, not according to, you know, uh, necessarily, you know, um, um, you know, whether or not we committed a grievous matter, but according uh, to whether we had sufficient reflection, full consent of the will. And that means, uh, was this guy mm -hmm. trying to do his very best according, as the Vatican Council says, to the dictates of his own conscience? Was he trying to do the best he could, according to the dictates of his country, according to his awareness, his knowledge, his understanding, was he trying to do the best he could uh, to be a good person? And, and if that's all he could do, if he had no awareness of God, remember North Korea is an atheistic state, right? And it wouldn't be surprising if he had little to no awareness of God, you know, then mm -hmm. God would judge him accordingly. And of course, take him into the same paradise. Mm -hmm. And of course, post factum could use all that suffering because the minute you, you know, the minute you get into, you know, the, the kingdom of God or the, even the purgatory, you would recognize immediately you know, the, what you were destined for in salvation and, and, of course, recognize the value of your suffering in the past. And, of course, you could give it right then and there to the Lord. So God's not going to hold people responsible for anything that they could mm -hmm. not freely choose or anything that they could not understand. It's just not going to. So that person in North Korea in an odd way you know, is, is in pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. He's blameless in a way for, for what he does not right. do, uh, you know, knowingly. And, and uh, in, in a sense, you know, Augustine, I don't know if he said this in a moment of kind of, you know, Augustine had those moods mm -hmm. where he could blurt out a phrase, you know, and, uh, but he said, you know, more people are saved out of ignorance than anything else. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm thinking to myself, hmm, that's probably true, also mm -hmm. in my case. So, you know, mm -hmm. I do really think, you know, that uh, that guy in North Korea is in, in pretty good shape. So uh, uh, I would not worry about him. God will not hold him responsible right. for what he couldn't understand right. or but what he could freely right. choose. So, so that being said, sometimes uh, mm -hmm. people have said, well, if that's the case and somebody is in a situation like that, well, it would be better if I never brought the gospel to them because if by bringing the gospel to them, I put them at risk. What do you say to somebody who uses that <laughs> well, logic? Well, you know, uh, <laughs> I could see how someone could uh, draw that conclusion, except for one thing. The gospel literally means the good news. Mm -hmm. Everybody does not have to live in the pallor, the specter of depression and darkness that these poor people in North Korea have to live under. I mean, you look at what's going on in South Korea. One, in South Korea, you've got a nation that is literally turning to Catholicism and Christianity in extraordinary numbers and percentages. I mean, they're just so open 
listened to the mm. good news, right? And of course, why? Because it's the good news. Mm. I mean, compare yourself. Just ask yourself one question to answer this. Would you rather live in the darkness of never knowing that there's an eternal life and suspecting strongly that there isn't one, mm. that, that, you know, that the only thing in life is just survival and misery and pain and that there's no hope for anything better? Mm -hmm. Or would you rather, uh, you know, know and be aware of the fact that this salvation and unconditional love and joy awaits you mm -hmm. and know how to purify yourself right now in this earth to even facilitate that love and that joy coming into your life eternally with God and the blessed in heaven and that you would want to orient yourself on that path and in that hope and through that faith? Would you rather have have that existence or would you rather have the specter of just sheer emptiness, darkness, alienation and loneliness mm -hmm. that that poor person in North Korea is living in even in the midst of his family, right, or her family, uh, uh, we're, we're talking about just two different qualities of life. One with the expectation of hope and the presence of real consolation, and one where there's just omnipresence of desolation, of fear, of darkness, and emptiness. Holy mackerel! Mm -hmm. You know, you'd have to be a masochist to choose the darkness. You know, uh, we have an obligation to go and bring light to the nations. Mm -hmm. Consolation the hope of salvation in Jesus Christ, the path to salvation through the purification of our faith and love. This is why we're there. We're to bring happiness, mm -hmm. joy. Remember what Jesus says in John 15, 11. I tell you all these things that my joy may be yours and your joy will be complete. This should be on the byline of every missionary order. The objective of every missionary is mm -hmm. to bring the joy of the good news, right? Pope Francis is encyclical, mm -hmm. right? The joy of the gospel to everybody in every nation because joy is exactly the objective of Jesus and, of course, right. will be the end fulfillment of our lives when we're in perfect non-egocentric love with God and others in heaven. Very good. So that's, that's okay. a good question. Very good. And a convenient time for us to take a break here and for you to take a <laughs> breath. Right. And we'll be back with much more with Father Spitzer. As he said, we're talking about bringing light shining on in the darkness. The title of his book, we're talking about the conclusion. Going to kind of review everything and wrap it up. You don't want to miss any of that. Stay with us in the heart of Father Spitzer's universe where faith meets reason on a regular basis. Stay with us. And thanks for staying with us in the midst of Father Spitzer's universe. And I know a little bit about bookmarks. I've got mine right at the end of this book in the conclusion. And that's where we're turning right now as we turn once again to Father Spitzer. And the light shines on in the dark. So I got to tell you, you got a wonderful cover there with that, uh, that elk or whatever it's supposed to be with the shot <laughs> exactly. there. I have to tell you, I was coming out of work the other day, and there's Father Mitch pulling up in his, his car, and he's got one of those heads in the front seat. I don't want to tell you. He's a different kind of Jesuit, a different kind he of Jesuit. A, oh, yeah. Have you been to his house? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of elk heads, moose heads, sheep I know. Heads. It's very scary. You feel like there's always something watching you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. He's a, a hunter for souls and many other creatures, uh, some of them with four legs. <laughs> exactly. So let's talk about the light shines on in the darkness to conclusion. You say there is a light in the darkness, the light of salvation, love, freedom, transcendence, and personal actualization. The darkness through faith makes this light all the more profound and precious, refining our freedom and love to an ever-grading, authentic, purified, and unconditional state. So what is the light? 
Well, uh, just, uh, you know, it's, uh, what I was trying to do is elaborate on that old phrase, you know, uh, thank God for the darkness, mm -hmm. because that's the time when the stars come out. In other words, you can only see stars in times of, dar uh, in times of darkness because they're not bright enough to overcome the sun. But the stars are multiple and they're beautiful and, you know, and what are those stars? Uh, one of them, of course, is, is, you know, the purification of our faith. I mean, that, that's a, it's a huge star. We sometimes, you were just talking about autonomy, uh, you know, in the, in the last segment, and, and uh, it's uh, really, in our culture, autonomy is a big deal. Mm -hmm. You know, not having to ask anybody for help, and if we have to, well, that's not an occasion for compassion and empathy. That's not fair. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, the minute you start saying that, you begin to resent the, the, the God who mm -hmm. has given this unfairness to you, etc. cetera. So you, the grace of suffering just slips through your fingers. But the main thing uh, is, you know, this dependence on God is absolutely essential. And, and mm -hmm. you know, that means we have to develop that awareness of God's presence, that he's here with us. And, you know, this is something we acquire throughout life. And, and, and it's certainly something I acquired throughout life. And suffering was very instrumental in that. You know, recognizing the presence of God, that he's right there with me, that when I need his help, things actually begin to happen when I ask him for that help. And, uh, you know, I, like I said, sometimes, you know, I can be, uh, you know, completely discombobulated. And, uh, you know, I don't even know that there's someone in a room, mm -hmm. you know, and they'll come and say, are you uh, lost? You know, mm -hmm. and I'll go, actually, I'm kind of blind, you know, yeah, oh, right. okay, you know, and, and th but you'll get an offer the minute you say that prayer. But eventually what it cultivates in you is the awareness that God is there. Mm -hmm. and, and not only God, but the Blessed Virgin Mary is there. You know, the, the saints mm -hmm. are there, they're present, they, mm -hmm. and they, they're, they, you know, you learn of their benevolence you know, in their presence. God is benevolently present. Mm -hmm. God is not hatefully present. Mm -hmm. God is not resentfully present. You know, we have to take Jesus' image of God very, very seriously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we could absolutely choose the darkness, no question mm -hmm. about that. <clears throat> but at the same time, God is benevolently present. And suffering has helped me immeasurably to purify my faith. <clears throat> it's helped me immeasurably to be aware of God's presence. Immeasurably to know, <clears throat> you know, that uh, God is benevolently present mm -hmm. and not, you know, spitefully present, etc. Another area <clears throat> so important is to know uh, we're not God. <clears throat> you know, um, so many times we can get this, you know, super impression, mm -hmm. you know, how could the church live without me, or I'm so good, mm -hmm. I just don't know why everyone else is bad. And this is normally called spiritual pride. Mm -hmm. And spiritual pride is a devastating thing, particularly for people who are advanced in the spiritual life. Every saint says we got to be aware of it. Mm -hmm. But there's one way to cure a messianic uh, problem, mm -hmm. and that's to give St. Paul a nice eye problem. <clears throat> and then, of course, it all of a sudden becomes, a, you know, present to him. Wait a minute, wait a minute. He says, <clears throat> that thorn in the flesh, that angel of Satan to beat me, that's not a bad mm -hmm. deal. You know, um, <clears throat> it's going to protect me and keep me from getting proud. Mm -hmm. He puts it right out there. And what he means by pride is they're spiritually pri uh, proud because he's talking about spiritual blessings and having, you know, mystical experiences, things of that nature, caught up into the, you know, the heavens and so forth. When he's talking about that, right, he's talking about spiritual pride. Mm -hmm. And so he is just saying to God, you know, thank you for this. I know how important it is. But another thing so important to me mm -hmm. has been dropping the autonomy thing, uh, not just the pride part of it, but, you know, being much more empathetic with people. Because when you drop the autonomy piece, uh, piece you, <clears throat> and you really come to the, uh, you know, the, uh, the reality mm -hmm. that we're interdependent, we need others and others need us. We can ask for help. There are lots of people out there who are willing to grant it. 
when we stop, uh, you know, thinking that for ourselves, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden we empathize with others much more deeply. And when we do, we understand them much more deeply. Mm -hmm. And when we do, we can walk in their shoes much more deeply, which means that compassion becomes the state of the day rather than autonomy. And, and that's really where, where Jesus is, is asking us to go, to be in that interdependent state. Uh, you know, there's so many other mm -hmm. things, the opportunities to serve that are enhanced, you know, the, the possibilities for testing our mettle. Mm -hmm. This is so important, you know. You don't know you have courage until you have to use it. That's just the way it is. And you're never going to know that you have to use it mm -hmm. unless you actually experience real fear. Mm -hmm. So if you want to know, do I have the courage to really endure pain for the sake of uh, my faith? Mm -hmm. Do I really have the courage to endure pain to do something noble for somebody else? Mm -hmm. Do I really have the courage? Well, you're never going to know until you get put into the fire where you're going to have to endure whatever it is, mm -hmm. pain or maybe embarrassment or discrimination or even death. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we don't know until we've had to do it. Mm -hmm. And if we, you know, if we're able, you know, uh, to me, some of the best moments of my life have been the ones where I'm just in abject fear, mm -hmm. right? And, and uh, you know, uh, all of a sudden you, you move your way through it you know, not only through uh, courage, but of mm -hmm. course through faith, mm -hmm. you know, and it's the combination of the two of mm -hmm. them. And you move through that, you go, whoa, that's going to be one of the most defining moments of my life. And it is. Mm -hmm. It's one of the most defining moments of our life. Without that possibility of fear and, and mm -hmm. suffering, we right. would have never had it. So people say, you know, why couldn't God just leave us in the pleasure bubble? Why couldn't right. he just leave us in a perpetual state of, you know, childhood? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I remember my little niece once. She, she was in about the seventh grade. And, mm -hmm. you know, as a parent, she was going to have to grow up. And so I was, you know, kissing her goodnight, you know, and she looks up at me and she goes, Uncle Bobby, I don't want to grow up. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, I know. Mm -hmm. I said, it's a, it's a tough prospect. Mm -hmm. But I said, in the end, you'll know that it was right. worth it when you do, you know, because there's so mm -hmm. much more to life than what you right now experience mm -hmm. through your childhood and, and your parents taking care of things for you. You just can't live. Right like that there's much more about megan that we need to know right and so uh you know in, yeah, in sort a of way peter pan syndrome yeah. people used to call yeah. things like that right right yeah yeah exactly so you know there's so much so there's many stars in the darkness mm -hmm. but the stars are not going to come out okay until it's dark okay phase one you talk about theological preparation for mm -hmm. suffering you have foundations one through the Foundation one, conviction about the resurrection. Foundation two, affirming the unconditional love of God. And in part three of that, you say, recognizing God's presence in our suffering. You say the alleviation of suffering is secondary to our and others' salvation and freedom. Yeah, it's really true. God has two higher priorities in mind. Um, uh, than um, uh, alleviating our suffering or other suffering. And what's that? Our salvation and other salvation is number one. And number two, our freedom and others' freedom. He's got to, you know, without freedom, we don't even have the capacity to love. Mm -hmm. And without love, what's the point of life? So, of course, God absolutely has to have these two priorities ahead of things. Mm -hmm. He's got to preserve, you know, he, you know, his highest priority is going to be to bring us to eternal life in his love and joy. And his second uh, priority has got to be to protect our freedom so that we have the possibility of loving. And that possibility of loving is going mm -hmm. to be our eternal destiny. The possibility of not only overcoming our egos, but the possibility of choosing others, uh, you know, as, as equally important to ourselves love your neighbor as yourself mm -hmm. and of course when we get to that ideal right the joy that will come from that at the banquet in the heavenly feast will be immense so I mean we do God has those priorities and there's no way around it mm -hmm. and so if there's something you know standing between the alleviation of our suffering 
and our salvation or other's salvation or our freedom or other's freedom, God's going to take the higher priorities first. Mm -hmm. He has to. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the meaning of our lives, the whole reason for our existence and our whole eternal salvation is thrown into complete jeopardy. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, God is he's pretty intelligent. He's pretty wise. <laughs> okay. He's infinitely intelligent and infinitely wise. He knows what's good for us. And so he allows us to endure that suffering. But of course, in the midst of it, he, the Holy Spirit is opening doors to new opportunities. The Holy Spirit is helping us to grow in virtue. The Holy Spirit is helping us to grow in love, compassion, empathy. The Holy Spirit is, is, is helping us to grow in faith and depth. The Holy Spirit is allowing us to serve others, to serve the kingdom of God through those very instruments of suffering. The Holy Spirit is totally active in times of suffering to enhance our salvation, mm -hmm. our ability to bring salvation to others, to enhance our freedom and to bring uh, enhanced freedom to others and along with it, virtue, love, and faith, mm -hmm. and ultimately, of course, the kingdom of heaven. Okay, and, and just below that in the book on, on page 494, mm -hmm. you say, we need humility and trust to give God the benefit of the doubt. What do we mean That's giving right. God the benefit of the doubt? Well, sometimes when we start suffering, right, this, in, this intuition comes into our head that God has rejected us. An intuition comes in that God has abandoned us or God wasn't even present from the very beginning and we were just telling ourselves a lie. And of course, the, the evil spirit is out there stoking that baby. Now those things rise up right out of our subconscious mind, right? But of course the evil spirit is stoking those thoughts, you know, yes, 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 that's right, God's not around you little fool, naive little fool, you just needed a crutch and you went for the bit. Oh no, God really liked you, but you did something wrong and therefore now in your moment of pain and suffering, he He's abandoned you to punish you for your past sins. Or yes, 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 God has rejected you, you sinful, little, horrible wretch, you. I mean, uh, you. after all, don't you know how God really views you? Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, all these things, they pop into our heads. Mm -hmm. They're right there on the cusp of our subconscious mind. And when we suffer, what's the first thing we do? We turn inwardly mm. and when we turn inwardly all these things just pop out of us we're not taking you know feedback from uh, people around us we're not thinking about getting feedback from god mm. we're literally trying in some sense to manage it ourselves mm -hmm. and when we do that right all of a sudden all those horrible images of god come out all untrue so what i just say is before you do anything else give god the benefit of the doubt what benefit of the doubt? That he's wise and he knows what he's doing. That he hasn't abandoned us. That he is completely and unrestrictedly loving towards us and benevolently loving towards us. He doesn't hate us. He's not paying us back for a sin. He's not tormenting us. And of course he exists. Of course he's present. He's been present. You know, I mean, if you want evidence for that, I've got two full books of evidence for it. Just read The Soul's Upward Yearning and New Proofs for the Existence of God. Mm -hmm. And go to that modgiscenter.com website. i got a zillion free articles. Evidence galore. Mm -hmm. But the point, of course, is there's more than evidence. There's the reality of his presence in our past lives. And we know it if we just stop with those crazy subconscious intuitions coming over, taking over our conscious mind. Just give them the benefit of the mm -hmm. doubt. Don't let those things take over. And of course, once you say, okay, you're all wise, you're all loving, you're all present, you're benevolently present, you know, okay, where are you leading mm -hmm. me here? Where's the Holy Spirit opening the doors in front of me here? If you do that, you're going to be in great shape because you're mm -hmm. going to use your suffering toward your salvation or the purification of your faith and love. And if you don't give God the benefit of the doubt right up front, mm -hmm. for all intents and purposes, you're going to get really either resentful mm -hmm. or despairing. Mm -hmm. That's where it's going. 
And the evil spirit is the only one who's going to gain from this. He wants you to have the bad image of God. He wants you to despair. He wants you to be resentful. He wants you to think that God has abandoned you. He wants you to think that God is punishing you. He wants to portray God as the payback God, the terrifying God, the disgusted God, Mm -hmm. all the gods, that the false notion of God that we've been through. So the main thing is, Give them the benefit of the doubt. And when the temptation comes again and again and again, choose God. Give them the benefit of the doubt. And and eventually, your mind will become unclouded. Mm -hmm. Remember, the more you go out to God and the more you go to others, the more unclouding, you know, unclouded your mind will be. But Mm -hmm. if you stay within yourself, the clouding thickens and of course it really can get very pea soupish in there Mm -hmm. and when it does it's really hard to to see the truth through all the pea soup and then of course Mm -hmm. we begin to sink into either despair or seethe in resentment Mm -hmm. both are based on a completely false premise Mm -hmm. stoked by the evil spirit because we're not listening to the holy spirit of course, in Yukon Cornelius's case, he, he said the fog was as thick as peanut butter versus pea yeah. soup, for those who might remember <laughs> Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer there for... <laughs> but, but the that same image back was ways, there, but right? I do remember. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. And that comes in, and you're talking about phase two, contending with suffering in short-term, spontaneous prayers and times of suffering. Also, foundation mm-hmm. five, mitigating fear and choosing consolation. This one... Yeah. Use reason and prudence to create a backup plan, damage control, and team response. And you also say reshape the expectations by stopping the refrain, I can't be happy without, and replacing it, I can be happy with a new way. I mean, it seems to me sometimes people's mm-hmm. greatest unhappiness comes with discussing about an option that doesn't actually exist. Yeah, no, that's right. And, and uh, of course, you know, as I always say, comparisons in times of suffering are the recipe for insanity and and uh, i've done it that's i'm an expert right you know you know two weeks ago i could see part of that mountain and today i can't let me torment myself some more because Mm -hmm. i can't do what i used to be able to do or joe can do this but i can't do this that's not fair and of course once you start in on the comparisons right uh, it's just it's absolutely meaningless Uh, instead of comparing yourself to what you could do and then finding yourself wanting look at what you can do and how you can complete the work of God how you can work for the kingdom of God with what you do have how you can work for your family with what you do have how you can actually purify yourself or or help others to be purified through what you do have so for all intents and purposes what we want to do is is uh, you know take advantage of the opportunities there and of course prudence Mm -hmm. is really important because as I pointed out before for, you know, there's initial panic. And everybody knows if you're in, into sports or if you've been in a war, you know that panic is the worst thing that can happen because right away that panic just causes the, the adrenaline not to be used to make you much more astute, mm-hmm. but the adrenaline makes you completely numb. And if you're numb, you're not thinking, you're not feeling, you are literally not moving, and that is a very bad thing. Mm -hmm. So what you want to do is immediately start thinking Mm -hmm. and force yourself to think. And how do you force yourself to think? You know the answer to this. You ask good questions. So you ask questions like, okay, uh, what's a backup plan? Okay, how can I get some damage control here? Okay, who am I going to ask to help me get some damage control? And, 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 you know, who can I rely on if this thing fails and plan B fails? Who can help me to get plan C going, right? Who can I ask? And, and then how am I going to set up and structure my life, you know, <coughs> if all these things happen, et cetera, et cetera. So you start asking really good questions, and I give a whole list of those questions there. And once you start asking those questions and your mind starts thinking and you get into those thoughts, watch the mm-hmm. panic subside. 
There's nothing better than a good dose of thinking mm -hmm. that is incited by a good question to stop the panic and to get serious right. about moving beyond it. And of course, this is going to bring a whole new dimension to your spontaneous prayers. Mm -hmm. And those spontaneous prayers combined with good rationality, mm -hmm. that's going to lead to a really good way of moving through the suffering mm -hmm. toward your salvation, toward deeper love, deeper faith, mm -hmm. and toward the service of others. Right, and I would think, you know, sometimes in business they talk about things called worst-case scenarios and the idea yeah. of saying, when you're in a situation mm -hmm. like that, stopping, like you said, taking a deep breath and stepping back and say, okay, let's say that even all these things I'm afraid of are actually true, what is the yeah. worst thing that's really going to happen to me? And is, yeah. can I not ultimately deal with those, even if I'd rather not deal with them, but if they were to happen, would I, could I deal with them? Exactly, and and there always there's always a fallback plan. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I, I just don't have a situation in my life. I mean, for my eyes or for crisis situations when I was president of Gonzaga or whatever it might have been, right? I mean, there were always different back, fallback plans that you could implement. You, you just had to think about it, and you had to figure, okay, who's going to help me right. with the fallback plan, mm -hmm. and and what are the steps I need to take for the fallback fallback plan and how do I do damage control in the mm. fallback plan and of course if you're thinking 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 it takes your mind off the panic right. and focuses your mind on the results even if it is right. a worst case scenario and you're absolutely right, right. a worst case scenario and managing that rationally right. Right. does remove fear right. it really works well our Lord tells us not to worry right I mean so <laughs> and a yeah. lot of times the worry keeps us from over. actually stepping out and figuring out what I can do in this situation right not why Absolutely. but what right in a lot of cases exactly also rules for the first and second discernment here uh, never make an important decision in times of effective or spiritual desolation and why mm -hmm. do you think that's so important I know that was uh, a primary focus yeah. of St. Ignatius so. uh, that's that's exactly right and and what's going on there this is kind of um, you know Ignatius has these rules right so when suffering occurs uh, what St. Ignatius is saying, and what I'm saying, you know, from my own experience, you know, that when, you know, a, a door slams, the Holy Spirit is generally opening one or two doors. Something is going to open. And, you know, I give some, some of the clues that we get when doors open. So, for example, sometimes when a door opens, we, we uh, feel a sense of consolation, right? Um, sometimes when a door opens, it'll just be a person who says, you know, Spitzer, you, you ought to think about this. Mm -hmm. and, and you'd never thought about it before, but you all of a sudden, you feel, you know, oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, or you're just, you're reading a book or an article or something like that, or you're watching an a EWTN television program. Definitely. And, and you're, you know, a door has slammed, and all of a sudden you hear something on the program, or you read a line in the book. <clears throat> and all of a sudden you go, oh, that's interesting. But the thing is, is it stands off the page. Mm -hmm. It's almost like somebody is saying something to you, like, get an idea. You know, so it's like the Holy Spirit, right, saying, here, you know, here's something that might prove helpful. So Ignatius says, okay, you should be very discerning. You should, you know, and you just don't leap at it, but you mm -hmm. should look at it. And you should start by asking, you know, do you feel like this is prudentially a good idea. Mm -hmm. This it, is this something you can do. Is this something that could really help you to find a new path in life that could, where you could really maybe minister in a way you couldn't before, or you could do something for your family you couldn't do before, whatever it might be. Is this just prudent? Is this rational? Is this mm -hmm. a good idea in your life? Secondly, do you feel like you're being called to this? Right. In other words, sometimes it can be qu quite surprising. You know, as I've said in many stories before, I just right. didn't think I had any career in teaching or preaching or anything like that. You know, it was through crazy suffering and opportunities that I got to that point where all of a sudden it became apparent. 
you know, I could really teach, yeah, you know, and, but uh, why and that our had not occurred to audience agrees oh. a thousand percent, and that's why they <laughs> tune in every week to hear those words of wisdom. <laughs> but we must come to a conclusion, as the book did as well, The Light Shines On in the Darkness, Transforming <laughs> Suffering Through Faith. But there's so much more ahead. We'll continue with Father Spitzer when we see him once again next week. And give us your final blessing, Father, before we go. Absolutely. And bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. And may the Spirit of Almighty God, the Spirit of Jesus Christ, descend upon all of you to allow you to know and have trust in the wisdom and the love that motivates the heart of God and our Lord Jesus in every moment of suffering and that animates you through the Holy Spirit and leads you through the Holy Spirit to find salvation and love and faith in that suffering so that together we may be in love, in joy, in the heavenly kingdom with our Lord who has called us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Father. We shall see you next week, and uh, we hope you'll stay with us as well. Don't forget about Father's wonderful book through EW10.com, RC.com, but you've got also Pioneer Priests and Makeshift Altars, a new book from EW10 as well by our good friend, Father Charles Connor. And of course, Father Spitzer's book is always worth checking out now that we've gone all the way through it. Next week, something really special, seasonal, The Gift of the Magi, not the L. Henry story, but something different. I'm Doug Keck, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week at the intersection of faith and reason where we're always hanging out every Wednesday. See you then.